Hello, my name is Marcus. I'm the compiler of a collection of therapy quotes entitled 1001 Windmills of the Mind. This is TQ 1048 to 1065. Therapy quote number 1048. The second part of the dwarf magician's name, Stiltskin, is an ironical diminutive of stelze, the German word for stilts. Thus, man is again defined in this fairy tale as one who puts on airs, elevates and elongates himself artificially. So weak is his position that the mere revelation of his name becomes the denouncement of the fairy tale. The dwarf must pay the price of the discovery by giving up his claim to the queen's child. So we haven't had a quote from Edmund Burglar in quite some time, so, so I'm happy to put another Edmund Burglar quote here. I'm happy to say that this collection, um, 1001, windmills, 1001 Windmills of the Mind, plus all of the including the bonus material, all of the quotes beyond 1001. So now we're into the bonus material. This collection, as far as I know, is the only collection that has uh, quotes from Edmund Burglar's work. He, w he was the second most prolific author of psychoanalysis, 24 books, 300 papers. So fill in the blank. The psychology of okay, blank. Whatever you put in that blank, chances are he talked about it. The psychology of uh, fashion, the psychology of money, the psychology of uh, blushing, the psychology of anxiety, and and so on. Um, he's most famous for coming up with the term uh, writer's block. Apparently, a lot of uh, writers would approach him to uh, complain that they're stuck. And he would explain the reason you're stuck, the reason you have writer's block, is because your writing up until this point, up until this point, is just pseudo-aggression. It's just a defense mechanism. You're just uh, denying something basic. And you got tired of it, so that's why you're stuck. And the author would say, what am I denying? Well, Okay, then Burglar would explain his uh, theory about that. Now his theory is, is covered in the in the core collection, uh, when 1001 Windmills of the Mind. So I, I won't uh, re replay it here. But uh, so the phrase "writer's block" comes from Edmund Burglar. Um, so here's another one of his quotes. Edmund Burglar is one of the mentors in this series. So Edmund Burglar, James Masterson. Karen Hornai, William Fairbairn, Margaret Mahler, and Melanie Klein. Edmund Burglar, though, he, he's, um, he's the most direct. Uh, he, he's the one that'll talk about things that no one else wants to talk about. He's the one that'll address the elephant in the room, or he's the one that will say that the emperor has no clothes. So he, he's the most, uh, <laughs> I guess, the bravest or the the most uh i'm not sure what. <laughs> but it's funny to read his his writings uh, sometimes he has a little argument with with uh these very intellectual authors uh and and these these arguments are kind of humorous sometimes um he, he says um that he he's constantly finding himself in a position to confront their rationalizations he thinks uh these writers are always trying to preserve their lie, to preserve their, uh, to preserve their uh, pseudo-aggression. Burglar has this thing called pseudo-aggression. He says that's a defense mechanism against not being aware of why he's not using authentic assertion. Right. And again, his theory uh, is covered in, in the collection. So this one here, he makes a reference to uh, the fairy tale, Rumpelstiltskin, and he points out that uh, in that particular tale, um, 
<laughs> he made a joke by calling it that this tale must be an, an, uh, an anti-male manifesto and he was explaining how uh, you know the, the miller is uh, gave up his daughter how weak is he and then uh, the king exploits the daughter how bad is he and then the dwarf uh, you know blackmails the, the daughter and uh, so he, he he notes that you know men are painted poorly but that's just sort of a, a side point here but fairy tales are like dreams there's a condensation of different ideas some call it telescoping so you you have a variety of different motifs and they're all brought together in one condensed it's called uh, condensation right and the fairy tale uh, so you have a superficial line that tells the story but underneath it you have a you have dream sequences right and uh, so like these fragments come together uh, th through the condensation that's apparently one of the uh, the functions of the primary process thinking that takes place in dreams and, fa and remember fairy tales and myths like the child said are true on the inside not on the outside right? so he, he was making the point about narcissism here that he that uh, the character this dwarf was artificially elevating himself or elongating himself or putting on airs with the stilts so he's on stilts his name is stilts so in the fairy tale, she has to figure out that he's being pompous or he's being uh, false and somehow he's putting on airs. So if she can recognize that he's putting on airs, uh, then she uh, is no longer uh, entranced or hypnotized by the dwarf magician, right? So people, so as mentioned before in one quote, the people with the narcissistic pattern are famous for that ability to be hypnotic. Um, Uh, in their narcissistic display, they try to unconsciously appeal to other people's remnants of their lost narcissism. Right? Um, because narcissism is a regression. You're a child, and, uh, and when in, in that narcissistic, childlike state, the world revolves around you. You're safe. And, um, the parents take care of you, and or you're in the womb, and all of your needs are met. So there's always that sort of unconscious uh, appeal. Someone said recently, we never fully let go of that fantasy of how wonderful it was in the womb or shortly after the womb. Of um, The theory there is that uh, in the womb, the baby thinks it's all about him. He has a need and it gets met. After the womb, after birth, in the extended womb, it sort of continues. He has a need and his mother is attuned and meets the need. And the child thinks it's all about him. He doesn't have a sense of differentiation out of the fusion with the mother. So that, that, that's a wonderful time. It's considered bliss and heaven and all these wonderful phrases. Um, so someone said that recently, um, no one fully uh, forgets that. And they sometimes yearn for that still or have that as a background fantasy. Some people have it maybe more than others, let's say. So, um, so this, uh, so burglar was saying here that uh, when the lesson is, I think, uh, if you call out narcissism that it's false airs, uh, then then you're free, right? So in this case, she got the her daughter back, right? Uh, the child got back. You know, the overall um, motif of this fairy tale, like a lot of fairy tales, is that. Uh, if we uh, betray ourselves or criticize ourselves and we learn it from our parents and then we do it to ourselves, our feelings disappear. Our gold or our inner child is exiled. So the miller did it and then the king does it. This is us doing it to our, ourselves. So all of these characters in the fairy tale are elements within ourselves. So we sometimes betray ourselves like the miller. We sometimes uh, exploit ourselves, you, you know, uh, give away our goals like or take it for granted like like uh, the king you know and then we sometimes uh, make uh, compromises with ourselves like with the dwarf so all the, now actually that scene where the dwarf is turning the straw into gold now that's another that's another motif that's just the the organic psyche restoring itself right but then the superficial idea is that he's blackmailing her and uh, you, you have to give me the 
your child, that kind of thing. So that can be a metaphor for how we betray ourselves sometimes. Right. So, so interesting, yeah, so I didn't know that, even though uh, I'm, I have a... I have a half German name. Marcus is a German name, right? <laughs> I didn't know this. <laughs> still skin, so it means stilts. I think the rumple part just means, uh, according to the dictionary here, it just means like making noise and, and you're on stilts making noise. So if you recognize that, uh, then you are not seduced away or allured to believe that. So a, a con man would be a good example. A con man tries to impress you, you believe him, then you you lose your uh, investment, whatever, right? But if you recognize he's a con man, then you save your, you save the grief, that kind of thing. You save your feelings and your, your, your saving, hard-earned savings and so on. Okay, uh, so we've had a lot of quote. This is just a minor, minor idea of Burglar. He, the core of his work, um, is uh, in a nutshell about um, the superficiality of how we might be living. How we're not aware of what we're doing is really just a kind of repetition of a childhood event and we're trying to master a childhood trauma and we enroll and we're not aware of it. And uh, he says uh, so with people with an insecure attachment style that explains the futility of it then you, then in midlife you're tired of it, and then you learn about psychic. His jargon for this, uh, his theory, his, his main theory is called psychic masochism, psychological masochism. Nothing to do with physicality, uh, like emotional. Uh, okay, so just briefly, um, <laughs> the child needs to bond to the parent. That's pleasure. But if the parent is rejecting, the child still has to bond to the rejecting painful mother. Now his pleasurable life force gets mixed in with the rejection and the pain of the mother rejecting, but the child has to bond. So there's this pleasure and displeasure thing. So he's calling that the libidinalization of guilt, right? So the, the life force got uh, put into pain, so it's got mixed in there somehow. So there's a, there's a confusion there. So what happens is the child wants to bond, uh, the mother rejects it. So we're talking about an insecure attachment style. The child wants to protest. He's going to try, but he, he doesn't have motor skills. He can't run away and look for another mother. He can't shield himself. He can't protect him. He's, he's stuck. He has to bond, right? But he's angry about it, but he can't protest, right? Now he feels, of course, somehow, uh, uh, feet is or something like that right so let's call the memory of these four steps the wish to bond the rejection the wish to protest but he can't and then feeling defeated those four steps let's call the memory of that the superego I'm just simplifying it right now when the person gets older they don't know what their real wish is because it gets mixed in with this memory of when the child had a wish it's mixed in with pain okay now what's the person going to do with his life? He, he's got to be active. He, now he's got motor skills. Now he can move. He can he, he can uh, protest. He can leave. He, yeah. Now he has physicality as he's in an adult body. So, but what's he going to do with this energy now? So Berkler says, a lot of what people do is um, a fake protest against the mother refusing their needs when they were a baby. That's pseudo aggression. He calls it. And then after a while, you realize it doesn't solve anything. Then you feel somehow defeated or disappointed, that kind of thing. So I've way, way overly simplified his theory. Uh, but um, if, if, if you happen to follow the whole series, I think by this point, uh, you'll know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> So Burglar, uh, I'm just happy to see another quote from Edmund Burglar. Um, in, in the preface to one of his books, someone wrote that there are, there's still some unfinished manuscripts that he was working on before his passing. And uh, so we're, there's still a hope that maybe they'll be released. Um, so there could be some more 
hopefully there'll be some more releases of his material um, okay uh, okay this next one um, I thought was sort of a, an example of uh, calling out Rumpelstiltskin right remember if you name something then you're free of it a little bit that kind of thing so here's an example of a, uh, just a, a mild example of it from a self-help book uh, called uh, Staying Okay by um, Harris. Okay, TQ uh, 1049. The only way to stop the Karpman drama triangle game is to get out of the triangle. Okay, so call Rumpelstiltskin, right? So for example, if a person with a narcissistic pattern is being uh, bullying somehow, quote, I'm going to uh, come on straight with you, unquote. So you can reply, well, uh, would you like a cup of tea first? Okay, or, quote, you know, John, that's what I've always liked about you, your ability to see the problem accurately and get to the point without beating around the bush. Go for it, unquote. Okay, uh, so he says here, stroke his inner chi uh, his, his child ego state while he basks in your compliment He'll forget what he was going to say. If he doesn't, oh well, prepare to talk. <laughs> okay, and uh, this comes from a section called Parent Shrinkers in the Book Staying Okay. So everyone, most people have heard of, about the popular self-help book, I'm Okay, You're Okay. A lot of people don't know that there's a sequel to it called Staying Okay. And in that book, there's a section called um, parent shrinkers. So again, just briefly, the Carpenter drama triangle. Uh, in, in dysfunctional relationships, one person is uh, so the parent is critical. So that's he calls that the persecutor. The, okay, the child is uh, hurt by it. That's the victim, and then you comfort yourself with some emotional eating that's the rescuer and we go around in this triangle right? and a person can even switch roles sometimes so in relationships a person can be the rescuer the person can be the victim the person can be the persecutor that's what they call it so to escape from all this for example if somebody is being in the persecutor role the inner critic let's say um, well you notice it and one way to, to call Rumpelstiltskin, he says here is, um, you know, uh, that's what I like about you, John. Uh, your ability to see the problem accurately and get to the point without beating around the bush. What is what? Go for it. What is it? Oh, okay. Because okay. <laughs> maybe the person was, was being provocative, just wanted some attention or just wanted some to be seen and respected and that kind of thing. A more sophisticated version of calling Rumpelstiltskin is given by Masterson. Um, in his books, uh, he talks about what's called mirroring interpretation of narcissistic vulnerability. So very overly simplified, if a person is being critical uh, in the therapy session, Masterson might say uh, some elaboration of it's uh, painful it's so painful for you to focus on yourself. So what you do to soothe yourself, to comfort yourself, is to focus on me. And what do I got to do with this situation? You know, what's 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 what do I have to do with it? You see, so you you kind of acknowledged his vulnerability. It's so painful for you to focus on yourself. Okay, that's a narcissistic vulnerability. And what you do to soothe yourself? So he's in charge. So he's okay. So you're acknowledging the narcissism. Uh, you're acknowledging his. Uh, his defense mechanism defense before ego you acknowledge his defense mechanism and then you can question you know about it you know and then he and the most important thing is you're acknowledging his defense mechanism it's so painful for you to look inward and think about what's going on within and how you're feeling so what you do to avoid all that and not face it is to uh, is to just uh, say it's my fault how was it my fault? I'm, I wasn't around when you were two weeks old in the nursery in that city over there. You know, the third. 
What's that got to do with me? I wasn't there. <laughs> I don't think he would say that. But <laughs> so once again, I'm the compiler of the quotes, right? So just another disclaimer once again. Okay. Uh, okay, let's uh, move on to, let's talk about music for a minute. You know, this next quote, maybe I, I, I'd like you to maybe participate in this next quote a little bit. So here's a, here's the next one, 1050. It's been said of man, music furnishes them with a medium for expressing themselves, for exhibiting their joy in living, their aspirations for the future, their nostalgia for the past, their desire for freedom, their love of action. When you read this quote or hear it just now, does a song come up? Or what song comes up? What's the first song that comes up when you hear this quote? Again? It's been said of man, quote, Music furnishes them with a medium for expressing themselves, for exhibiting their joy in living, their aspirations for the future, their nostalgia for the past, their desire for freedom, their love of action. Their love, you know, just in that moment when I read it, I thought of ACDC, their love of action. You know, it's a, it's a hard rock song. It's, it's, there's that action element to it. But, um, so do you, did a song come up for you? Oh, okay. I was thinking, you know, that might be um, a bit of a free association. It might tell you something about yourself. The first song that came up when you read this quote or, or heard this quote. Um, on my end, when I first saw this quote in the book, the first song that came up to me, when you talked about nostalgia for the past, expressing yourself, um, the first song that come up, came up for me was... Um, a rock song uh, from uh, from uh, the eighties uh, in my hometown Toronto. There's a, a band uh, called Santers. Uh, so I'll just play one of their songs. This is this is the song that came up for me. <laughs> so this is called uh, "Dreaming" by the band uh, Santers. Oh. It's not playing for some reason. Let's try again. No. Oh, sorry about that. Oh, for some reason, didn't play. So let's uh, maybe I'll try again. Hold on a sec. Is it here somewhere? Okay, here it is, here it is. Okay, so this is, uh... It takes a minute, there's a short introduction, but hold on. Yeah, I think we do. From an album called Guitar Alley. It's a tune called Dreamin'. Thank you. 
<laughs> so that's uh the song is called Dreaming by Santers, the Santers band. The singer is Rick Santers. Yeah, talented uh, musician. Uh, he, he uh, for a brief time, he, he was a member of the band Triumph. Right? Okay, uh, so yeah, so what song? Uh, so again, mu music uh, helps us to express ourselves about our aspirations, about our dreams, about. Um, Nostalgia for the past, wish for freedom, wish for action, to be alive, and uh, a lot of songs are a wish for that oneness with a beloved, right? The union, it, to return to that symbiosis. Remember before that secret wish to merge, right? <laughs> so the, to be one, I can't live without you, all these songs, I can't, I can't right? Um, Okay, uh, okay, a major thread in this uh, series is uh, the idea of repetition compulsion. If the baby has a pain or a trauma, uh, the psyche, the theory is the psyche wants to recreate it, to master it, to re redo it, to do it over again, so it's not so painful. So they're trying to master the trauma. But after the age of five, psychic structure is pretty much set. And if the person is still trying to relive the childhood trauma, uh, that's called pathological repetition or repetition compulsion gone awry. Right? So if the mother was rejecting, then you want to see others as rejecting and then you're angry at other people innocently, thinking you're trying to master the trauma of the mother being rejecting, for example. So we've had a number of quotes. There's a major thread in this series, repetition compulsion. So we'll just add uh, two more quotes uh, to the collection. Okay, TQ 1051. The repetition compulsion sees the individual repeatedly enter the same form of unsatisfactory relationship. A traumatizing caregiver may engender an insecure attachment style, causing the child to cling more closely to the caregiver in order to reduce his insecurity. So this reminds me of another song that we've uh, played earlier in the series called uh, It Must Be Something Psychological by Katie Lee. She says in the song, um, she's, she's always attracted to unavailable, emotionally unavailable people. Why, why, does she, why is she only attracted to emotionally aloof, unavailable people? And, she's, and she concludes the song by saying, I, I love you because you're... It's really quite explainable, she says. She loves him because he's unattainable. Okay, That's a repetition compulsion of the mother being emotionally unavailable. She's trying to master that trauma. A very good song. Right? It must be something psychological. And again here, the more the mother, the more rejecting the mother is, the more the baby needs the mother, the more he's going to cling to the mother. He'll even become her if he has to. He'll identify with her even though she's so refusing and so rejecting. That's the narcissistic pattern, by the way, when a person identifies themselves with the rejecting mother and they become like her. Right. Um, okay, this uh, next one, also on repetition compulsion. A little uh, edgier, a little more uh, obscure idea, but uh, anyways, here it is. Okay, repetition compulsion or a traumatic script. A traumatic script. The client tends unconsciously to build a life around the repetitive script. For example, in the middle of the night, um, I ran out of uh, petrol. Okay, and then felt badly. This feeling of failure then led me to ask, who loves me? Okay. <laughs> So he's implying that when he was a child he felt unloved. Now as an adult he recreates situations where he's alone and no one's there and unprotected. He's on the highway with no gas. And now he's thinking, oh, who loves me? 
as a repetition compulsion of the child thinking, gee, mommy doesn't love me, who loves me? So he's repeating, so he's recreating situations. Someone might disagree with this, but he's saying it's unconsciously. He may, maybe he did it unconsciously. All right, in, in that paragraph, he was saying that uh, he had plenty of chances to buy gas. Uh, there was not an issue of uh, not having no gas, you know, uh, some misunderstanding. He knew the area. He knew where the gas stations were. He had enough money and all that. So he just, uh, he just, uh, he knew, and he knew his gas tank was low. Oh, you'll be fine, he thought. So he wanted to recreate a scenario. He wanted to recreate a childhood scenario to see if he can make it less painful. To relive it to see if he can make it less painful. He's trying to master the trauma. That's the main idea about repetition compulsion. Okay, this next one here is another little uh, abstract thought, but I, I leave it as a question mark. So, um, 10, uh, 53. Trauma and the disassociation to which trauma leads freezes time, which makes it impossible to formulate certain kinds of new experience. Instead, potential new meanings remain unformulated. The root of clinical access to frozen time is the interpersonal field. So if I understand it correctly, he's saying if the child is traumatized or there's an insecure attachment style, uh, the person is a little disassociated. So they have new experiences, but they can't take them in. They can't enjoy them because they're still stuck in the frozen time emotionally. They're still frozen emotionally earlier on. So they have a present experience. They go to a beautiful place and uh, it's nothing for them because they're still, you see. So he's saying here, uh, when this happens, we don't formulate new experience. We don't integrate the new experience into our psyche because we're frozen in the past. Potential new, potential new meanings remain unformulated. What often happens is there's a delayed onset. Right? So someone enjoys something. Ten years later, they look back. Yeah, you know, I really liked that. But I didn't realize I liked it at the time that I li that I was liking it. I didn't realize he, that he was liking it. Maybe a lot of people can relate to that there. They have something, they like it, but they don't know they like it. When they lose it, then they realize they like it. Like, like the song says, the Joni Mitchell, the, uh, the Big Yellow Taxi song, don't you know it always goes, that you don't know what you got till it's gone, that, that kind of thing. By the way, we did play a Joni Mitchell song in the series. Uh, it, it was a, she made a parody song about her shrink she, in the song Okay, she says that uh, the character in the song saw saw a therapist, and uh, and uh, the song is about make, poking some fun at the therapist. My analyst told me. <laughs> I think most people will recognize that song. Okay, uh, get a little jargon here. The word schema it just means script. By schema, the authors mean self-defeating emotional and cognitive patterns that begin early in, develop, in development and repeat throughout life. But he's implying a, a traumatic script or schema. So schema can be neutral, but he, his definition says, no, if, it's, if we're using the word schema, it refers to a self-defeating emotional and cognitive patterns. So that's a traumatic script. I always thought schema was a very neutral term for any kind of pattern you learn, even a healthy pattern. And this variation of it says, no, the authors, they're talking about a traumatic script. That's what they mean by schema. And that's what we're repeating in the repetition compulsion. So in the repetition compulsion, it's about healing our schema, right? or healing, writing in a new script or healing the old script, that kind of thing. Okay, uh, okay, let's move on to 1055. Some jargon from Kohat. Self-object self -object transferences represent, in the words of Ornstein, a thwarted need to grow. Interesting phrase, right? A thwarted need to grow. So this is the third reference to Kohat's work in recent videos. Kohat's not really covered much in the main, in the core collection, but in this bonus material, 
I notice uh, Kohat's work is coming up. So he's saying self-object transference. So from the baby's point of view, the mother is a self-object. One word. Himself and the object, the mother, are one. From the baby's point of view, they're one. That's the narcissistic pattern. Others regard others, those with the narcissistic pattern regard others as an extension of them. It's the self-object tra transference. Now he's saying here, if that takes place, that represents a thwarted need to grow. The baby needed to grow. And the Kohat says, in order for the baby to grow, to develop, he needs to be mirrored, which means attuned. The baby, uh, oh, hold on a sec. Okay, we got a... Uh, That's one of the herons, by the way. Yeah, beautiful birds. Next time we'll see if I can zoom in if they pass by. Um, so, so Kohat says. The baby needs mirroring or attunement means the mother is attuned and meets the baby's needs. Right? Another one, no? Okay, false alarm. <laughs> the baby, oh, hold on. Oh, that's just an ordinary crow there. Okay. <laughs> By the way, the crow is one of the companion animals in this series. So we've got the blue jay, the fox, and the crow. Now in the bonus material, we're adding the heron and the mosquito. <laughs> so we're adding the heron and the mosquito okay, <laughs> to our companion animals here. So the baby needs to be held. Right? That's called, Kohat calls that containment. The baby's, he's in the womb, he's being held, he's safe. The baby's seen, he's mirrored, and uh, he has a third one called twinship. Um, but we'll just stick to those two. So anytime a person with a narcissistic pattern is engaging in their narcissistic quest to get their supply, right, to um, repeat how they didn't get seen, so they're, they want others to see them, to communicate that they weren't seen, so they're a little bit aggressive about it. Okay, that represents his thwarted need to grow. That's a great little phrase there. You know, you can almost use this sentence for other uh, aspects. Um, for example, um, emotional eating represents one's thwarted need to receive love, to have received love or one's thwarted need for love. Emotional eating represents one's thwarted need uh, for love, something like that. Okay, uh, we have another quote on the pu'er, the eternal youth, the Peter Pan syndrome, the mama's boy, another qu quote about this one. Okay, TQ 1056. The pu'er prefers to live an eternal dream state, resistant to growing up. Yet denial of the maturational impulse will only lead to it happening anyway, but in a negative form. For example, uh, the Pu'er's philosophy, right? never grow up. This was made, this was unmade by the missing developmental element. That's a Pretty good quote, I think. The missing developmental element. So a person may think he can be a youth uh, his whole life, he doesn't need to grow up. And, right? But something in him, one quote was, uh, born to become an adult. We're born to become an adult, adult development. So if he denies that, the body's going to rebel. Something will happen. That's typically the midlife crisis or... Uh, a psychosomatic symptom. Okay, next one, uh, 1057. It's not the sugar, salt, and fat, but the unconscious acting out and repetition compulsion to find 
safety, mirroring, and acceptance to consume them that makes an emotional eater. So in other words, don't blame the cookies. That's not what's making you an emotional eater. right? It's the repetition compulsion of not being properly loved, not being seen, not being accepted, not coming from a, you know, and all that. That's what makes a person an emotional eater, the repetition compulsion of trying to communicate that they didn't get the love they needed. That's what makes it an emotional eater, not the product, not the cookie. Right? Cookie's neutral, that kind of thing. And we had that quote yesterday about um, the mind and the brain. So the brain is just the instrument of the mind. The, the mind tells the brain what to do. So if the psychic structure of the mind is that they have this memory of not being loved, this mind tells the brain that. Then the brain has a reaction that way. Okay, uh, next one. 1058. Crazy making seems to be an attempt to recreate the symbiotic oneness the person missed out on as a child. A oneness that was needed in order to complete the separation individuation process. Okay, may I refer you to the last video? Uh, we talked a bit about the need for the child to have his symbiotic needs met. Okay. So um, that's the foundation. If the child is prematurely hatched out of the symbiotic egg, uh, that leads to the hostile provocative attachment style. Right? Um, if the person didn't get their symbiotic needs met, uh, they may try to create drama thinking they can recreate a symbiosis with another person, make that to find a self object. That's what. Yeah, someone said also um, in the fusion between the baby and the mother, um, no, just the crow. Okay, okay. <laughs> Okay, in the fusion between the, um, the baby and the mother, the child's mind and the mother's mind, from the child's point of view, it's one. Now, if, he, if there's a fusion there and he identifies with the aggressor, he has that ability to flip back and forth between himself and his mother. So in this crazy-making process, um, still, um, still okay with the recording here? Is that better? Oh, okay. Um, th that's why uh, a person with the bully pattern will uh, co-opt his victim's words and say they're his. He can flip back and forth easily. They can project himself. He can identify with the. He can identify, think he's the victim because he, he's fused there with that oneness. Okay. So that's the crazy making from the receiver's point of view. What's going on? He just hurt me, but he's acting like. I hurt him, but I didn't hurt him. And he's saying all the things that I should be saying to him, but he's, see how, okay, what's going on? The person is trying to find the symbiosis that he didn't get as a baby. Every baby needs that symbiotic phase. So this is one of Mahler's uh, key points here. And for the first few months, the mother and the baby, they're fused there, and psychologically fused from the baby's point of view. Then at around six months, roughly, the baby hatches out of this symbiotic egg. That's called the stage of differentiation. He knows where he ends and his mother begins. There's, there's, there's that differentiation. He has a sense of, um, you know, I and other, right? That kind of thing. Okay, uh, ne next one here. If unconscious conflicts are to be securely overcome, the client must become more accepting in his attitude towards his inner child of the past. I think every self-help book probably says this. We have to accept that we that, that when we were children, we were vulnerable. We have we have to accept that we were fallible. We were we have to accept, we have to give ourselves a cut ourselves a little slack here. When we were children, uh, we were dependent. Oh, hold on a sec. 
No, that's just a crow, I think. No, oh, sorry, that's a... Uh, I'm not sure what that is. Maybe just a large seagull, I guess. You know, if we're really lucky, we'll get an eagle. Uh, one, only once I saw an eagle here. I don't see the seals. Here's another seagull, I think. Okay. We have to accept the inner child of the past. If a person puts down somebody who's weak or vulnerable, they're rejecting their own inner child of the past because that was because that's what happened to them. So people who mock others, who are disadvantaged or, or, or something happened to them, and they're putting them down, they're trying to communicate okay, what their mother did to them when they were a child. You see? Burglar calls that a negative magic gesture. Actually, technically, he says they're trying to communicate what they wish didn't happen to them. They're doing it to others. They're mocking others. Burglar says he's actually trying to say, this is what I didn't want my mother to do to me, what I'm, what he's doing to others. All right, so if you look up negative magic gesture. Oh, hold on. Okay, let's see if I can get a close-up of this. No? Did it work? No, it didn't work. Oh, sorry. Okay, <laughs> we'll try next time. I think there's a way I can zoom in. Okay. Um, okay, let's uh, talk about journals. Keeping journals. People have kept journals of their thoughts and feelings for centuries. A number of researchers found, or these researchers found that emotional disclosure through writing had remarkable health benefits. That's quite a statement, right? These re researchers found that emotional disclosure through writing had remarkable health benefits. Right? Now you might want to write down the resistance to writing in a journal. I feel resistance to writing in this journal. I'll talk about the resistance. Okay, so you acknowledge the resistance. What I'm okay, so uh, maybe I'm concerned that if I write in a journal, then what are you concerned? Yeah, so a parent's going to read it or something, or um, it'll be used. You know, see, or what am I afraid would happen if I were to write in the journal? That's the typical self-help question. Right? But if you can write about the resistance to writing in a journal. Why am I so resistant to writing in a journal? What is it? What's going on? I don't want to write this journal. And you're writing it, and at the same time you're writing that in the journal. So you write about the resistance. And that's the first thing you write about. Why am I so resistant to writing in a journal? I, I, I stop and I'm, I'm angry now. And why? What's the resistance? I want to figure this out. So free association. Is this, is this reminding me of something? Am I being triggered? I seem to be... Maybe I'm being triggered by the idea of writing in the journal. Does this go back to when I wanted to express myself in childhood? Okay, well, let's think about it. Let's experiment with that. When I was a child, were there times when I wanted to express myself, but I was overwhelmed and couldn't, or was punished for doing so? Is that it? What is it? Come on, what is it? <laughs> so Joni Mitchell, we have a quote from Joni Mitchell, that the singer I mentioned before, about writing in journals. She, she would say that. She would say... She would say, take out the pen and face the beast. So she would talk about resistance being the beast. You got to face the beast, she said. <laughs> and finally she would write, and that would be her song. And then she'd write a hit song, right? Um, okay, uh, next one here. Psychotherapy is as old as mankind. Psychotherapy is as old as mankind, and it ranges from the ancient ritual of the medicine man to current okay I just filled it in here as object relations theory so my understanding is that the most current approach to soul repair is, is object relations theory 
sort of a uh, an an improvement and a developmental accomplishment from the original psychoanalysis from 100 and some odd years ago. Now we're using object relations theory. Okay, uh, in large part thanks to James Masterson, he uh, helped uh, clarify it. The founders of object relations theory are often considered to be Melanie Klein and William Fairbairn. What Masterson did, he, he took their work, added Margaret Mahler's uh, work, and uh, came up with the Masterson approach. Right? <laughs> Basically, object relations theory. And others, of course, have contributed. Okay, we have a... I want to issue another Golden Windmills of the Mind Award. We, we already have, we've already issued five Golden Windmills of the Mind Award mentioned yesterday. So just briefly, once again, we have a Golden Windmill Mind Award for the comedy film Bob and His Enlarged Amygdala. Okay. Um, another Golden Windmill of the Mind Award for the 1979 animated film version of Peer Gint by Vadim, I forgot his last name. Okay. Uh, another Golden Windmill of the Mind Award for Robert Bly's audio work on the men's movement, on Iron John, and Sibling Society, and all of the, psycho all of the, the psychology he talks about, that, his whole audio collection. Maybe not so much the poetry side of it, but uh, the more psychological side of it. Okay, we have a Golden Windmill of the Mind Award for Rollo May's book, The Cry for Myth. And we also have one for Karen Horney's book, Our Inner Conflicts. Now, a sixth one goes to James Masterson's book, The Search for the Real Self. That's a great book. Um, it's a... Uh, it's, it's, it's a wonderful introduction to object relations theory. Okay, so we have six Golden Windmills of the Mind award out now. You know, this thing about ancient ritual, that's an interesting one because apparently long ago, um, these ancient rituals were, were, were very benign. People dressed up and danced and sang songs and told stories and things. It was, it was just to deal with anxiety. It was just uh, to deal with uh, the anxiety of, of uh, general anxiety. That's it. It wasn't used to. Um, it wasn't used against people. It didn't promote prejudice. It, it was a peaceful activity. Right? So it's very interesting. Uh, we have a quote maybe coming up in the future about how that got co-opted and how that got damaged. Um, but I'll save that for later. Okay, um, so ancient rituals were just a defense against anxiety. So if you see traditional cultures dressed up and dancing and uh, and all that, that's how, that was their way of, uh, in part, to deal with anxiety. Right? That's it. Um, they didn't create dogma around it. They didn't create certain um, fearful things about it. Um, they didn't create us versus them mentality, or they didn't promote psychological splitting. They didn't do these kinds of things. It was more, um, more of a soothing thing, I guess. Uh, in the future, we'll have a quote by um, a guy named Haas. He he uh, explains how um, how that got sort of co-opted. Um, okay. Uh, Okay, the next one here, 1062. The necessary interpretation of internal conflicts results from the painstaking and delicately built process of collaboration, at times paradoxical, to jointly arrive at an understanding that makes sense to both partners. But the key element in change, however, requires the client to carry out private cyclical actions okay, of renunciation and mourning of that which feels to him either needed or wanted. 
Again, the key element in change requires the client to carry out private, cyclical, psychic, inner psychic actions of renunciation and mourning of that which feels to him either needed or wanted. So again, change, we change within, then we can change our interpersonal relationships, we have to change within. So psychic structure. So giving up infantile megalomania, right? So that's renunciation. Okay. Uh, mourning, giving up certain negative attachments to the rejecting mother, and so on. Okay, a couple of a couple of more here. Helping the client to be more compassionate toward himself or herself by recognizing human fallibility. They have to accept their limitations as human beings, accept the fact that they were and are fallible. Okay. Next one. You think of psychoanalysis as trying to take from you whatever you love. Perhaps instead it is trying to help you remove the obstacles to it. Okay, and the last one here. Psychoanalysis intends to lift the repression. We liberate the hidden wish. The symptoms vanish. We are emotionally free. Psychoanalysis believes in the vigor of rational thought. It dares to call up the secret powers of the underworld. <laughs> That's the third day in a row we've had a quote about this uh, metaphorical unconscious being referred to as an underworld, a psychological underworld. He says, psychoanalysis believes in the vigor of rational thought. It dares to call up the secret power. Okay, oh, okay just a baby, baby bird. Um, so that's the three-dimensional thinking, right? Okay, the bag we drag behind us. So you want to call up what's in the bag, and you need the ego for that. So you need the rational thinking, the vigor. Right? So uh, Haas called it uh, intellectual cowardice. You don't want intellectual cowardice. Uh, in, yeah, you. Yeah. You, you want to have intellectual courage, not intellectual cowardice. So intellectual courage is to uh, <laughs> look in the bag and and reown what you disowned in childhood, kind of thing. In other words, uh, make the unconscious conscious. Okay, uh, this has been my second uh, outdoor video. Uh, yeah, I like it. I'll, I'll try to do more outdoor videos. I hope uh, it helps me to deliver the material in a more calm way. I want to make my my personal goal is to present these in a more uh, likable, <laughs> in a more uh, in a, in as friendly a way as I can. Um, but that's why all of the quotes are posted below. Um, if you don't, if my delivery uh, is uh, unappealing or something, fine read the quotes, print them out, copy them out, write them out. Uh, I think one good exercise would be to collect all the quotes and put them in bundles according to topic. And so all of the quotes on repetition compulsion, compile them. All of the quotes on projection, compile them. All of the quotes on rationalization, compile them. Okay, all of the quotes on burglar's theory of psychic masochism, compile them, and so on. Okay, so thank you very much. This has been TQ 1048 to uh, 1065. Okay, so I'll play the song again. So we'll close out with the song. Guitar Alley. Uh, you know that one? It's a tune called Dreamin'.
So in this video we covered, we started off with a quote from Burglar. One of our mentors in this series. You know, if there's something no one wants to talk about, he might be the one that talked about it. You know. So, okay. We had a quote uh, from the self-help book, Staying Okay. A quote about music. I like this one here. It gives us, it furnishes us with a medium for expressing ourselves. Remember those ancient rituals, traditional cultures, they're expressing themselves. You know, uh, their joy for living. You know, someone said these traditional cult, these indigenous cultures, when they're doing their rituals, a lot of it is a celebration of life. They're celebrating. They're saying thank you. They're saying thank you, nature, mother nature, for the birds and the, for the beauty of it all. They're, they're celebrating. They're saying thank you. They have a lot of gratitude for nature. You know, So music can express our gratitude, our joy in living, our aspirations for the future, for our children. Right? Nostalgia for the past, our memories, our stories, storytelling, our desire for, you know, uh, to be emotionally free, our love of action, and that's, there's the dancing, song, dance, storytelling, ritual. Uh, so this, uh, this rock star, right? Rick Sanders, you know, uh, you know, he, he really uh, was very energetic on stage. He, he, was, he had a lot of enthusiasm and action on stage. And um, yeah, one of my favorite. Uh, you know, this song here, this is three dimensionality. You see, he, he's questioning himself like what, what happened in the past where is he now what's happening in the future he's questioning sort of the midlife situation i wonder who tomorrow i'll become what's gonna happen to me tomorrow he says so he's, he's questioning about his choices because remember midlife burglar burglar says he calls midlife a second emotional adolescence midlife is a second emotional adolescence just like an adolescence we make the transition from boy to man uh, in midlife we make the transition from man to elder or moving towards elder or mature right we, have, we also have to make that transition so there are two major transitions well three I guess but uh, so the second is adolescence and the third is midlife that's the second emotional adolescence so burglar's book called uh, the revolt of the midlife man the revolt of the middle-aged man talks about this he's talking about how adolescence is a kind of revolt from being to make the transition from boy to man in midlife he's emphasizing it's the same thing michael mead says uh the world needs more elders he says we need more olders to become elders to make to take on that second emotional adolescence to take on the hero's journey, right? The transition, to look in the bag, to, right? To, to have vigor, to bring up, uh, right? So he's sort of doing that in this song, you know, he's wondering. So this is a, a good three dimension, this is a good midlife song in a way, right? Okay, uh, and he's maybe mourning the loss of his youth in this song. He's even, he's even very brave. He's saying, oh my God, what happens if I don't... <laughs> so he's brave in, in this song, right? Okay, again. Okay, we had a... Um... Two more quotes on the repetition compulsion. Sometimes it's based, the repetition compulsion is based on a traumatic script. 
sometimes called a schema. And while we're in the midst of living the past and the present, we're not taking in the joy of the present. So we heal the past that we can enjoy the present. Okay, we had TQ 1001 was, oh, hold on. Let's see if I can figure out how to get close-ups for the next video. Yeah, TQ 1001, the quote there was, the past is to be remembered, but not to be lived as the present. If it is being lived as the present, we're not enjoying the present. We can't formulate the present. We can't metabolize or take in the present. We're missing the present because we're still living in the past all the time. Right? Okay, that was a TQ 1053 okay, schema. 1059, any dysfunctional behavior, any dysfunctional behavior, that's a thwarted, that represents a thwarted need to grow. That's a great phrase. Anything that's dysfunctional. You know it's dysfunctional. You're not physically hungry, but you're eating anyways. That's dysfunctional. That represents a thwarted need to grow. A person didn't grow, can't grow if he doesn't get the love. So that represents that. Right? Okay, one about the puer, being being the eternal youth, the, the playboy one, right? Um, that's that represents a thwarted need to grow. He didn't get seen, so he's he can't grow up. Right? Okay, this one about uh, the crazy making, the positive intention of the crazy maker. He's trying to find someone to form a symbiotic fusion with. He's trying to find his mother, but it can't be done. All right? So that's called pathological repetition. It's destructive to him. It's destructive to others. That's why it's called crazy making. The other person feels, what is all this? He can't be his mother. It's crazy. It's crazy making, right? No, no adult can be another person's mother, literally. But that's what the crazy maker is attempting to do in his unconscious attempt. Yeah? So that's why you want to make the conscious conscious. Okay, we have to be accepting of ourselves. We have to forgive ourselves for being just little helpless children. That's the way it is. We come out of the womb too early. No one knows why. It's just... Okay. We come out of the womb too early. We can't run out. We can't just run around like someone said. Chickens come out and they can just start running around. Humans can't do that. You know? Okay, the value of journals. I would say the first topic is talking about the resistance to writing in a journal. Most people don't want to do it. Okay, like the psychotherapy is is as old as mankind. Um, there are a lot of ancient philosophies. They're considered a form of psychotherapy. Okay. From, uh, from Africa and from Asia, some wonderful uh, philosophical uh, writings about understanding ourselves. Um, a lot of people are talking about the Tao Te Ching, you know, uh, those poems, they're, very, they're really uh, something, those poems, you know, yeah, or, or Ursula Le Guin, a famous author, she praises that very highly, she even wrote a translation of it. You know, come to think of it, I think we should award a golden windmill of a mind to Ursula Le Guin's translation of the Tao Te Ching. So that's a seventh uh, Golden Windmill of the Mind Award. So we have two more awards, two more Golden Windmill of the Mind Awards, two more Golden Windmills of the Mind Awards uh, offered in this video. Okay, so one for the Tao Te Ching, uh, the rendition by Ursula Le Guin, Right, 
and James Masterson's book, The Search for the Real Self. Okay, so we've got seven now. Okay, uh, can we end it on? Okay, hold on here. You know, Santos, I, 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 I like to refer him as No Frills Classic Rock. No Frills Classic Rock. He was just raw, just a guitar. His brother played the bass, uh, no, the drums. And I guess their friend played the bass. Just three guys. It was a trio, power trio. Uh, there was no fancy technology. It, it was No Frills Classic Rock, you know. Their biggest hit is called Mistreatin' Heart. And uh, they've got some other good songs, Time After Time and a few other ones. So. And this live version of Dreaming, I, I like this one. Okay. Uh, we have to help the client to be more compassionate towards himself. Not, not only in the present, but to be compassionate towards who he was as a child. Be compassionate to that person. Right? Don't think that psychoanalysis is trying to rob you of your narcissism. By taking away your narcissism, it removes your obstacle to love. Narcissism is a block to love. Right? And the last quote here is um, just a little poetic here. Psychoanalysis believes in the vigor of rational thought. It dares to call up the secret powers okay, of the unconscious. Okay. That's owning our projections. And we can do that in the journal. Right? In the journal. Okay? Emotional disclosure in the journal has remarkable health benefits. So that's, uh, we can call that uh, a part of mental hygiene. Keep a journal. Okay, I'll leave it here. So thank you very much once again. This has been bonus quotes to the core collection of Wooden Meals in the Mind. Bonus quotes, TQ, therapy quotes, uh, 1048 to 1065. They're posted below. Bye for now.